These are the most broken cards in the history of Marvel Snap. Galactus might not have been the most powerful cards in the history of Snap, but he was definitely in the top 3 in making opponents feel powerless and frustrated. When Galactus was first released in November 2022, he was a 6-3 with an own reveal that read, If this is your only card here, destroy all other locations. So you didn't need the current requirement of also be winning that location in order for Galactus to trigger. Most of the time, and this was before Alive was a card, people would play Galactus into a losing location so that they would play out their death and null without the fear of being Shang-Chi'd or to be able to play cards like Valkyrie or Shang-Chi themselves. Galactus was definitely one of the most controversial cards with a lot of people from the Marvel Snap community complaining about him and asking for a nerf. The problem with Galactus was unless you had some kind of counter against him, be it Cosmo, Debris, Green Goblin, or another control card, there was nothing you could do to stop him. The most aggravating combination was probably Wave on turn 3, Galactus on turn 4, into Spider-Man on turn 5, which basically locked your opponent out of playing anything for the last turn, guaranteeing you the win. And Spider-Man used to work differently, he used to be a 4-3, with an own reveal that read, your opponents can't play cards at this location next turn. So after a lot of complaints from the community, Galactus was nerfed to 6-2 with the same own reveal ability in January 2023. A lot of people didn't really consider this a nerf, like I mentioned earlier, it actually worked in your favor if you lost priority with Galactus, so you can't be shang chi But the reduction in power also made negative Galactus decks quite popular, or maybe it was just me who loved them. Shuri used to be different too, and more on that later. So the card you played after her did not need to be played in the same location as her. This resulted in some hilarious games where Galactus got absolutely humongous, so more like his comic self. Surprisingly, after this small nerf, Galactus was untouched for over 5 months until he was completely reworked and changed to his current form, but as a 6-7. Now you had to be winning the location Galactus is played in in order for his ability to trigger. I honestly thought he was quite balanced as a 6-7, but the complaints didn't stop there. The combination of Wave into Galactus into Spider-Man still upset people a lot. So as of September last year, Galactus is a 6-5 and is seen in only 3.7% of decks according to SnapFan. Galactus still has its fans, and people still play him occasionally. He's definitely not as polarizing as he used to be in his original form, especially in the current meta because we've had so many card changes and new card releases. Spider-Man's ability is now completely different, and losing initiative with Galactus is super risky because of Alive. Does anyone remember the dark days of Leech Leader? Thanks, Dara, by the way. Because I do. Leader was one of the first Series 3 cards I unlocked when I first started playing Marvel Snap, and it carried me pretty high in rank that season. Leader was released in beta as a 6 4 with the unreveal ability that read copy all the cards your opponents played this turn but on your side. Yep, that is right. He copied all all of the cards your opponent played but on your side. And if you didn't have priority and your opponent played cards that got buffed after being played, for example with Shuri or Silver Surfer, you will copy the buffed versions too. Winning with the old leader was pretty easy, you just needed to make sure that after playing leader, you would win two locations and voila, you've won the game since you copy your opponent's cards on your side, plus leader. Of course, there were also space issues and leader mirrors to consider, but most of the time, leader would end up in an easy win for you. Of course, people hated losing to their own cards, <clears throat> Loki. So they called for a leader nerf, and nerfed he did to a 6-3 around 6 months after release. Leader having a positive power didn't really sit with people that well because as long as playing leader in that location won that location, it was pretty much a guaranteed win. With a few exceptions like Sunspot Soaking or Dracula, Taskmaster and Silver Surfer decks. Of course, people were very unhappy about the nerf. So in the same month, leader was completely reworked into a super confusing card that no one could understand until they played him. Only once because he he sucked big butt, so nobody ever touched him again after that. He became a 6-7 with an on reveal. Copy all cards your opponent played to the location to the right, but on your side. This effectively killed the card because people started playing around it pretty quickly. Three months later, we got the leader that we have today, which is a 6-2 that copies the enemy card or cards with the highest power played this turn, but on your side. Today, leader is only really played in Sandman decks or by bots 
or if you get him from the raft. And maybe that's a good thing because I definitely don't miss the leader meta. High Evolutionary was the newest addition to the big bads of Marvel Snap, and since its release in May 2023, many of the cards he evolves have been nerfed. High Evo decks felt so strong when they first came out, they felt almost like cheating to play him. Anyone who didn't have him had to have Lucage in their decks to protect themselves against those pesky power reducing cards. One of the most popular earlier versions of High Evo decks also ran Lockjaw, so you could play your Wasp over and over again every time afflicting two enemy cards in that location with minus one power with zero energy while putting more power on board with lockjaw so hulk was pretty much always 18 power because he didn't need to be in your hand or on board to start gaining power and to say that there were complaints was an understatement pretty much everyone especially people who didn't have high evolutionary were calling for nerfs the first cards to get nerfed in the high evo package were wasp and hulk followed by the thing Surprisingly, Cyclops, arguably one of the strongest cards in the high evil arsenal, has never been nerfed. If played on turn 4, Cyclops could easily be a 310 or even 312 if it's a limbo game. Definitely one of the strongest 3 drops in the game. It seemed like the high evil's reign of terror had come to an end towards the start of December 2023, and although he was still being played mainly as a Loki counter, he was nowhere as oppressive as he used to be. However, the December 5th patch surprised us all with a huge Luke Cage nerf, who instead of affecting the whole board, now only affects the location he's played at. And Luke Cage was pretty much the only counter to the evolved Cyclops, the Thing, Wasp, and to an extent Abomination. So this change definitely brought back the popularity of high EVO decks. Today, high evil decks usually have the Sheenod package built within them with magic to guarantee a turn 7 and sometimes leash to make your opponent's tech cards useless. The deck also works pretty well with Kyera, one of the new cards of the Planet Hulk season to protect your Sunspot Misty and sometimes Nebula and all the Hulks plus Infinite. I'm pretty happy with where the deck is at the moment, but I do wish that Luke Cage would affect the whole side of your board again, even if that means he becomes a 3-drop. Oh boy, where do I start with Thanos? I've always hated playing against Thanos decks because of all the utility his stones provided. The devs have always been really careful with cards to let you draw more cards from your deck, that's why they've been so reluctant to buff Crystal. But with the original Thanos, every single stone, with the exception of Power Stone, would let you draw a card or two from your deck. Space Stone also worked differently and allow you to move one card at the location Space Stone was played at, so you could easily get into Sanctum Sanctorum, which was a lot harder to do back then because we didn't have Jeff yet. Soulstone was also ridiculously strong, not only did it have the potential of being a 1-5, but it also drew a card from your deck. To make things even worse, Queen Jet back then could reduce the cost of cards down to zero, and because the stones don't start off in your deck, they get shuffled into the deck at the beginning of the game, they all cost zero energy if you had Queen Jet on board. So the most popular Thanos deck also was running Lockjaw and Queen Jet, allowing you to cheat big cards out of your deck for free. Bear in mind that Lockjaw used to work differently too, there was no limit on the amount of cards you can pull from your deck per turn, so you were able to cheat out multiple big cards out of your deck for free starting on turn 3. To make things even worse, this completely broken deck also ran the original version of Leech, which was, on reveal, remove the abilities of all the cards in your opponent's hand. Oh, so you have a nice Thanos counter in the form of Killmonger in your hand that you're saving until turn 5 or 6 to play? Psych! <laughs> Here's a leech on turn 3 to make your whole hand completely useless. Anyway, you get the point. Following the nerf of Quinjet, Lockjaw, Space Stone, and Soul Stone, Thanos has seen a huge dip in popularity, especially since so many other overpowered cards have now since been released. Today, Thanos decks are once again quite popular. Before the most recent Professor X nerf in Thanos control decks in combination with Alive, and since then, Thanos Blob has been the meta. I mean, who doesn't love adding a casual 630 to the board with zero downside? Okay, so I actually have a very soft spot in my heart for Arrow because I started playing at the height of her power in November 2022. Arrow was a 5-8 that on reveal moved all enemy cards played this turn to this location. So the winning plan was very simple. Just win two locations by turn 6 and then play Aero on turn 6 into your losing location and voila, 
you've won the game! As long as you had priority going to turn 6, there was very little your opponent could do to stop you. Bear in mind that Doctor Doom wasn't as popular back then as he is today, so Aero was allowed to run unchecked until she was unceremoniously nerfed in March 2023 to only move the last enemy card played this turn to this location. Yes, there was a tiny nerf in between that reduced her power by 1, but that didn't really affect her play rate. You didn't play her for her power but for her ability. I'm pretty sure she would still be played even if she was at zero power. One of the most popular decks back then was Barrow. Not sure why it was called Barrow, maybe because Arrow is Bay, but it was basically a Death Wave deck before Wave was changed to work the way she does now. If you destroyed at least four cards, and death used to be a 9-12, and played the wave and nothing else on turn 5. On turn 6, you could play death for free, She-Hulk for 2 energy, and another card for 6 energy. Maybe Arrow? I would even lead it to make sure they infuriate your opponent even more. Arrow has seen another change recently, which has brought back her popularity a tiny bit. She is now a 5-9 that on reveal moves the last enemy card played anywhere to this location. She now can only move cards that have been revealed, so if you have initiative when you play Arrow, she will not move the last card your opponent played that turn because it wouldn't have been revealed yet. Instead, she will move the last card that was revealed no matter what turn it was played. She's been very effective at moving opponents Miss Marvels and disrupting Living Tribunal combinations. She's definitely nowhere near as strong as her glory days, but that's okay, we have other cards we can complain about. Okay, Shuri, Shuri, Shuri. Shuri in her original state was simply glorious. A 4-2 on reveal that doubled the power of the next card you play, no matter where you played it. This means that unlike now, you didn't have to play the next card in the same location as Shuri, but you could actually play it behind Cosmo to protect it. And then you just play your Taskmaster in another location, preferably one with armor in it, and voila, you win. And this was the days before Shadow King, so there was basically nothing your opponent could do to stop this combination unless you managed to cause one the Taskmaster location with priority. Or maybe play Galaxus. Because finally, Taskmaster used to work differently. Even if the card with the double power got destroyed, Taskmaster would still manage to copy its power from beyond the grave. Shuri was definitely one of the strongest decks of the meta back then. It was usually a retreat if you know your opponent is playing Shuri and they snap on turns 3 or 4. The deck was very predictable and linear, but there was very little you could do to stop it. Today, Shuri is a mere shadow of herself. She was still quite popular up until cards like Alive and Blob came out. Because she is such a predictable deck, it's quite easy to beat her with Alive, and Blob Thanos just puts out more power than Shuri without even trying too much. And of course, now we also have Shadow King that can easily and cheaply counter your buffed Taskmaster. So I didn't play during the beta launch of Marvel Snap in May 2022, but I'm told Nova used to completely dominate the meta in those early days. Nova was originally a 1-2 that once destroyed gave your cards plus 2 power. So basically what Silver Surfer does, but for all of your cards and for cheaper. Back then, Moon Girl used to be a 3-3, so you could easily play two Novas and destroy it with Carnage or Killmonger on turn 6 to give all of your cards plus 4 power. If that sounds busted, it's because it was. If you play one card every single turn for 5 turns and then play Nova and destroy it with another card on turn 6, the Nova works out to be a whopping 1-12, and that is being extremely conservative. Usually, you can probably play out a lot more cards resulting in more power. To nobody's surprise, Nova was swiftly nerfed to give only one power to the cards just one month after the release. He did manage to keep his two power until January 2023, which is when he was nerfed to his current form. Almost everyone underestimated just how strong Loki was going to be. Playing Loki on day one of Loki for all time season felt like playing Marvel Snap the Vegas edition. The highs were so high it felt exhilarating. I've never seen the collector get that big and neither was I able to play 6 cards in one turn and still have energy left over. Loki not only added power on board with the collector and himself being a 5 power card but gave you a handful of discounted cards 
apart that would usually synergize with each other. Combined with Queen Jet, Loki's energy cheating felt almost illegal. How is it fair that I can play out my opponent's Doctor Doom for 4 energy, while still being able to play a bunch of other cards? Cork for 0 energy? Sure. Shang-Chi for 2 energy? No problem. Vision for 3 energy and Iron Lad for 2 energy? It's perfectly normal. After around 2 days of uh, Loki highs, I hadn't really touched him since. In normal matches, I felt like I was robbing my opponent and we were playing completely different games. And in mirror matches, it all came down to who drew their cards better. The meta became Loki or Loki counters for almost a whole month. And it's probably the most popular Cerebro ever was. And people were forced to play Phoenix Force and Mr. Negative just to beat Loki. But of course, those decks are anything but consistent. Loki was a season pass card that came out on September 5th, 2023. And he remained untouched until October 26, almost two months of Clown Fiesta meta. That is when his energy cost got increased from 3 to 4. And was that the death of Loki? Of course not. His power was still there, he still worked with the collector, and the energy cheating was still there. I don't think I've ever had as little fun playing Marvel Snap as I did during those two months of Loki. And because Mobius and Mobius was nerfed super harshly to begin with, Loki was allowed to run wild unchecked. Up until recently, Loki was still one of the best decks in the game. Just look at the most recent Marvel Snap Conquerors event, Winter Royale, where three out of the top four content creators were playing Loki. In good hands, Loki is still a top tier deck. He's just not in fashion at the moment, and to me, that is a good thing. Moon Girl and Devil Dino was my go-to deck when I first started playing Marvel Snap, and I had no Series 3 cards besides Arrow and Leader. The deck was super consistent at putting out power on board, and in combination with Arrow, that deck secured me my first ever infinite rank. But the legend says that during the beta launch, Devil Dino and Moon Girl were completely broken. At beta launch, Devil Dino used to be a 3-0 with an ongoing ability that gave plus 2 power for each card in your hand, so the same as now, and Moon Girl was a 3-3 three, three, with the same on reveal. Do you see where this is going? Being able to play 2 Devil Dinos on turn 6, or 1 Dino on 5, another Dino plus Mystique on turn 6, sounds absolutely bonkers to me. Or even just playing one Dino and Moon Girl on 6 is adding so much power on board, so much power that even most 6 drops won't be able to contest with. Of course, both cards were very swiftly nerfed one month later, Moon Girl to her current state of 4-4, four, four, but Devil Dino was nerfed to only 4-0. Dino was allowed to stay like that for another 3 months before he was changed to his current form of 5-3. At 5-3, he is still one of the best cards in the early game before you start unlocking powerful series 3, 4, and 5 cards. He can consistently add a lot of power to your board and you actually still see him in top meta decks like Thanos and Loki. You may disagree with the number one spot here, but to me, Zabu was probably the most broken card to be released in Marvel Snap. Zabu was a season pass card of the Savage Land season, and boy did he shake up the meta. At release, Zabu was a 3-2 with an ongoing ability that made your 4 cost cards cost 2 less, a minimum of 1. So, if you manage to play Zabu on turn 3, all of your 4 energy cards end up costing 2 energy, which means you could play out a further 6 4 energy cards for the rest of the game. And the most frustrating combination in the game was probably playing multiple Spider-Man. Spider-Man used to be different like we mentioned earlier. It used to be a 4-3 with an on-reveal that locked your opponent from playing cards at this location next turn. If you manage to moon girl your Spider-Man or play Spider-Man into Absorbing Man on turn 5, you effectively stop your opponent from playing into two locations on turn 6. Some versions of this deck also ran Storm, so if everything went perfectly, your opponent is left with no locations to play in on last turn. Frustrating doesn't even begin to describe how it felt to play the game during that period. Of course, like with any lockdown decks, this strategy, although infuriating, didn't usually yield a lot of cubes, but the energy cheating from the original Zabu was not to be underestimated. Zabu allowed you to play a ridiculous amount of 4 drops. That is probably the period Crossbones shone the most in Snap. I mean, who would say no to a 2-8? And the most powerful deck at that time was probably Zabu Darkhawk. Darkhawk came out right before Zabu was released, and Rock Slide used to be a 4 energy card, a 4-6 if I'm not mistaken. Zabu on turn 3, Moon Girl and another 4 drop on turn 4 leaves you to play double Rock Slide on turn 5 and double Dark Oak on turn 6 plus 
another four drop of your choice. Anyone who managed to open Darkhawk from a collector's reserve, yes, you used to be able to open series 4 and 5 cards from collector's reserves, was bonkers lucky and just sailed the way through to infinite with zero effort. It's no surprise that Zabu was nerfed very quickly, one month after his release to his current form, but of course, not until the new season started, it is a season pass card after all. I hope you enjoyed this video, let me know if you think I've missed out some powerful cards in the comments below. As always, I would really appreciate it if you could interact with the video in any way, be it like or comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time, bye!